School is back in session. The weather's turning colder, and that means, as it has for the last three years, experts are anticipating at least some level of a COVID surge. But with a new booster, could this fall be different? Or will COVID fatigue and the CDC's latest move to relax restrictions lead to more bad news? We'll discuss that, surprising, at least to me, new research on long COVID and new rules around COVID in our state schools with Dr. Sabrina Asumu, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and an infectious diseases attending physician at Boston Medical Center, and Julia Rafeman, Assistant Professor in Health Law, Policy and Management, also at BU, she also leads the COVID-19 U.S. State Policy Database. Welcome to you both. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Reifen, starting with you, as we head into colder weather, what is the level of seriousness and what's projected in Massachusetts in our region? You know, I, I think that we've had a really nice summer where we've had lower transmission. We've been able to gather more safely outdoors. And now we do see that people are gathering in crowded indoor settings without mitigation. And so we can expect the levels to increase. We also see that leadership on policies really makes a difference. When we do see those increases, we start to see a surge in COVID. If we implement uh, mask mandates during those periods, it can reduce transmission, reduce the number of people who get COVID, the number of people who are hospitalized, who miss work because of COVID, the number of people who die. Hold your breath on mask mandates, I would say, Julia Reifman, considering where public officials are, but maybe what's your assessment of where we are, doctor, as we head into the fall? You know, I think that if we look at take the long view over the past uh, two years, we've learned a lot. We're in a different place. We have vaccines. We have we know a lot about the impact of, of indoor masking. We have testing and we have outpatient uh, treatment. However, what we do know is that in the Northeast, especially in Massachusetts, the fall and winter is a time when we spend yeah. more time indoors and cases are going to be uh, going to go up. So the new boosters are available. I'd like you to say, starting with a personal tale, I register at the local Walgreens near where I live in Inman Square in Cambridge, and not one single appointment was taken, not one uh, this coming weekend. So, Doctor, starting with you, is there any reason anybody 12 or over should not be getting the booster, assuming that they didn't get another booster at least uh, sometime in the last couple of months? You know, this is very important. You know, we see people are getting tired of more vaccines and we're all wondering, you know, what is the end game here? But the important point to note is that although, although the vaccines have been helpful, what we do see in the science is that there is something called waning immunity. And so the protection is, is, is going lower. And we also have variants that are more what we call immune evasive. And so they can um, overcome the protection from our vaccine. So it is really important for all of us who are eligible to get this new uh, bivalent vaccine, because this is how we increase the protection in the community. You know, uh, Julia Rafen, uh, I looked at numbers. I'm sure you know these much better than I. But for people who've had at least one booster shot, it's under 50% nationally. It's higher in Massachusetts, close to 60%. The numbers for teenagers are absolutely abysmally uh, uh, low. There's n no reason other than crossing one's fingers to believe there's going to be a better reception for this booster than the ones that came before, is there? You know, I, I think that what we do makes a difference. And so this is really a time for leaders, public officials to step up and to communicate to the public, um, to, to communicate to communities where there are lower vaccination and boosting rates, the importance of getting vaccinated now. This is especially important because we don't have those other layers of mitigation. So we're really going to be relying heavily on those vaccines and boosters. We see the boosters make a difference, and I certainly will be going to get the new vaccine, the new booster, as soon as possible. But, Julia, staying with you, if someone said to you uh, who was, you know, not an anti-vax nut, but somebody who was just anxious, nervous, and said, well, I read that there weren't even clinical trials with humans. They only tested this new Omicron variant responsive vaccine on mice. That's not good enough for me. What's the response to that? You know, I, I think it's um, important to look to the safety data and to see that we've seen COVID vaccines have been very safe and COVID is not safe. So if you want to be nervous, be nervous about COVID, be nervous about getting long COVID, be nervous about um, being hospitalized or having someone in your household who is. 
Um, what we see of the vaccines is that they are safe and that they help prevent those severe effects of COVID. It's too late to get vaccinated once you start to develop those COVID symptoms and you yeah. really want to have that protection before that happens, especially as we see community transmission will yeah. likely increase in the coming weeks. Dr. Sumo, a lot of doctors, uh, from what I read at least, in an attempt to make this more normal for people to get the COVID vaccine are suggesting that people getting it uh, to accompany their annual flu shot. Do you subscribe to that kind of doctorly advice? Absolutely. Get your, please get your, your COVID shot at the same time as you're getting your flu shot. Because the other thing we're really worried about is that we're going to have a pretty bad um, flu season. If we're looking at what we're seeing in the Southern Hemisphere, it is probably going to be a very difficult winter. So getting vaccinated is going to be very important against the flu. Can I just add one thing? Because sure, sure. the headlines in the media have talked about these bivalent vaccines, and I think it's so key and important to correct some of the information that's being disseminated. So number one, I'm underscoring what Dr. Reifman said, is that you know the mRNAs are not new. We have millions of people who've, who've been yeah. vaccinated in the country and, and, and overseas also. The key thing is that the bivalent vaccines were tested in humans. It was a BA1 bivalent, but it's, it was tested in humans in clinical trials. What we do not have at this moment is the BA5, BA4 combined with the ancestral strain, the one that we'll be using. But the bivalent approach has been used in, in humans. So it, it's key to sort of make that, that distinction that people are not getting something that's completely Understood. new and that hasn't been tried. You know, I want to stay with you, doctor, though, for a second. The one thing I'm concerned about, because I, initially I love the idea of saying, since most people get a flu shot, just do it when you get your flu shot. The flip side, and please disabuse me of this concern, doctor, if, if you think it deserves to be disabused, uh, the flu is serious. It's nowhere near as serious as COVID is. I look at the numbers in the New York Times every day. They're abysmal. 450 people a day. That's 150,000 people are going to die this year in this country from COVID. Maybe 20,000 will die, one-seventh as many from the flu. Are you worried that that pairing of vaccines is going to subliminally convince people that COVID is sort of like the like the common cold kind of thing and not as dangerous as it continues to be? It's interesting that you're mentioning that because for me, I would say I agree with you that COVID is not the flu and it's more serious than the flu where we sit right now if we look at how many people are dying of COVID. But, you know, I'm an infectious disease physician and I've been taking care of patients with flu every year and the flu is no joke. Many people die of the flu every year. So it's definitely something that we take very seriously. But I think that what we're doing by recommending those two vaccines at the same time, we're using an opportunity. Instead of having you come today for your flu yeah, shot and come back tomorrow, we just want you to get vaccinated so that we can get as many people as possible protected. Julia Rafen, let's move to schools for a second. I, I assume everybody watching, at least if they have a kid, knows uh, statewide at least, no more mask mandates, no more testing requirements. I went to your Twitter page, and you have something called equity policy principles for schools. What's that mean? What, what are you pre prescribing for schools anywhere, I guess, but particularly here? Yeah, you know, I think we're really trying to um, support schools and teachers and school communities. Um, and I we see that schools are really essential for our society, that we want them to be safe places where people can be healthy and learn in an environment that's conducive to learning. Um, and being able to stay in school with as little disruption as possible. We also want educators and staff who work in schools to be able to be there safely. Uh, and, and so it's important that schools, um, that we do have policies that help to keep them safe. We Unfortunately, they are crowded indoor settings where COVID spreads quickly. So we wanna make sure that everyone who is in a school setting is vaccinated and boosted before a surge happens. We also want to be prepared to bring in layers of mitigation if there are surges. Uh, so we do see that universal mask policies are far more effective than a handful of individuals wearing masks. So, so is, the, is, is the state prescription too lax in your estimation? You know, I think we would like to see much stronger leadership on surge preparedness and having a policy plan. And certainly we yeah. understand, you know, it's been a long period. It's very polarized. Um, but, you know, but I think that that we have swung a little too far. You know, at first we had really extreme mitigation measures while we learned more about the virus. Yeah. And then now we've swung to this period where we have no mitigation. 
And what we should really be doing is coming back to the middle and saying, let's use what we learned in a smart way and to really step up those layers of mitigation in surges. Now, unfortunately, we need to be ready to do that quickly based on what we're seeing in other settings where we have seen the start of school actually lead to those surges. Mm -hmm. So can we step up routine testing? Can we step up vaccine and booster delivery? Can we step up um, and implement universal mask policies, even just for a limited period of a few weeks when we do see surges? You know, we only have a couple minutes left, but I want to touch on one topic. I mentioned at the top some new research, that at least I found surprising, in the journal of JAMA, Journal of the Med American Medical Association of Psychiatry, this research that's saying psychological distress before COVID increases the risk of getting long COVID more than physical uh, things like obesity or asthma or hypertension or that sort of thing. Julia Reif, what, that's powerful information. What do you do with that in a society that is under-resourced in terms of helping people with mental health to begin with quickly if you can? You know, I think that we have to lead on taking care of one another, supporting one another through this in all senses. And so that is true with avoiding long COVID as well. Um, long, long COVID is a serious consequence. We have a lot more to learn about long COVID. But if we lead with coming together to protect one another, with making small sacrifices, you know, to, for, to wear masks for a few weeks so that we don't have anybody left with long COVID or left without a relative, um, uh, in a few weeks, then then we can get through this together. You know, I only have a minute left, doctor, but I read you say that you were concerned that the same structural racism that made blacks more likely to get COVID to begin with are the same ones that'll create barriers to people getting adequate care for long COVID. Are people focused on that or is that just another statistic that won't mean enough to people in power? You know what, you know, I, I think that's up to the people. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Quickly. Uh, let me go, Dr. Gonna, Sumo, if I can, I'm sorry. Now, I was gonna say, I really hope that we start paying attention to long COVID uh, because as what we're discovering is that for, many, for a very long time, we are gonna be dealing with the long-term consequ consequences of acute COVID. So what I would like to see is for us, number one, to get data and understand who's being impacted mm -hmm. and also make sure that everyone has access to healthcare. We don't That's know precise, we should make clear, we don't know precise numbers on long COVID. We just know they're a hell of a lot higher than originally projected. Julia Reifen, you have the last word on this long COVID thing quickly, if you can. Yeah, you know, I, I think we do need surveillance data on long COVID. We need to start gathering data on um, how many children in our schools are affected by it, mm -hmm. how many teachers are affected by it, how many essential workers are affected by it, and to think about what we can do to support people who are affected by long COVID structurally. The best thing we can do, though, is prevent it. So, you know, the best structural measures that we can take are to reduce transmission. And for that, we need leadership on these hard policy decisions um, that are aligned with evidence, equity, and inclusion. So we really hope to support our policymakers. We know it's hard, um, but we also know we can get through this together. So, um, so we really, we hope that the equity policy plan we've put out will be helpful for policymakers. We are really grateful. A, a hundred um, MDs and PhDs have endorsed yeah. the plan and over 150 experts. So uh, we hope that can be a resource as we go through the coming year. From your lips to their ears, Julia Rafen and Sabrina Sumu, thank you both so much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you for having us.